thank you all for being here. I know we ha have a few more folks that are looking for seats. Uh, we'll try to make sure we can accommodate everybody. But wow, what a spectacular day. It's a beautiful day outside, a beautiful day uh, inside the university. And so thank you students for coming. I look out there and I see those white coats. I just want you to know you are the reason every day that our faculty and our staff and our administration and our board of trustees get up to make sure that you have a great experience and a wonderful education. And we are so proud to have our students with us today. We're also proud for the number of alumni who have turned out. We've got a number of alumni. We have, I think, over 100 attending, 100 folks attending our CME course upstairs. We have, uh, tomorrow we'll be honoring uh, those that have had uh, their graduation 50 years ago and 25 years ago. Tomorrow we'll be honoring them and uh, we're just happy to have alumni here. The alumni do tremendous support for the university. They're our largest group of donors to the university and so they are really critical to uh, the continuation of AT Still University and often many of them have given for a long period of time the opportunity for students to learn uh, in their offices and uh, centers and hospitals. So let's have a round of applause for our alumni. <laughs> I see a lot of our faculty and staff out there, and once again, um, AT Still University and KCUM would not be what it is today without a fantastic uh, faculty and staff who, once again, this is their mission to make sure we can graduate the best osteopathic physicians and other health professionals. I'd like to have our faculty and staff stand up and our administrators stand up. I see Dr. Wendell, one of our vice presidents up in the back there, and saw some other folks, yay. <laughs> I don't know if we have any Board of Trustee members, but we have some former and current Board of Trustee members in between the two rooms. But our Board of Trustee members, every 90 days, they leave their families, they leave their jobs, uh -huh. they come to some crazy place like Kirksville, Missouri, or in the winter, Mesa, Arizona, uh, and they spend uh, three or four days, they pay for their travel, and they do this, they sign up for nine years. So think about that. You could have an eight-year-old, and by the time that you're done with doing your trusteeship, they could be almost graduated from high school. So if we have any board, current or former board members, thank you for all you do to keep the university doing what it needs to do. We also have a couple special folks. Uh, you're going to hear from uh, uh, the individual who was president when I graduated just coming up, but we also have Dr. Blondenfeld, who was the president of A.T. Still University. So if you'd like to stand up, Phyllis. She does not like this. Sorry about that, but, uh, but it's well deserved. And then the Tinning family, I'd like for you to stand and we'd like to just acknowledge the Tinning family for being here to support. <laughs> and Dr. Wilson, I saw you, thank you. It's been a great weekend for uh, KCUM and a great week for things moving forward and we'd like to, we'll hear some more from you tomorrow and we'll be talking about some really unique things about KCUM, so thank you. All right, without further ado, Dr. Strait is an Associate Professor in our OMM department. Uh, more importantly, uh, he has a, a great memory and a great uh, fondness for uh, some of the things that Dr. Tinning was able to accomplish during his presidency. So thank you, Dr. Tinning. Thank you, Dr. Phelps. Good afternoon, folks. Um, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you for being here and welcome. Uh, I have, they do have the privilege of introducing our Founders Day lecture this year. Uh, we are honored to have Fred C. Tinning, Ph.D., KSOM President Emeritus, present the 2017 Fred C. Tinning Ph.D. Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture entitled, The Witnesses Surrounding Us and Preserving Traditions Planning Tomorrows. Now then, folks, there has a whole many multiple pages of things that this man has done. We don't have time for me to read them all. There wouldn't be any time for him to speak. So I'm going to kind of focus this down on the things that I, I can share, I think I can share the best for you. Dr. Tinning is a well-known and world-renowned osteopathic medical educator an administrator who has long been committed to the preservation of our osteopathic heritage. He has dedicated his career to serving in the development of several new osteopathic colleges and pioneered research and development of a simulation laboratory utilized for hands-on student experience in working with patient models and clinical evaluations. Through his devotion to the philosophy of osteopathy and the profession, he has been the recipient of many honors and awards. When Dr. Tinning became the eighth president of the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine here in 1984, he said he was committed to one goal. I do what is, to do what is right for the institution by preserving traditions and planning tomorrows. He served as president of ATSU Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine from 1984 to 1996. That commitment served him well throughout his 12-year tenure. Before he retired in 1996, the school dedicated a new education center in 1994 that is named in his honor, 
the Teening Education Center. He's a graduate of the Michigan State University. He received a Distinguished Alumni Award from the MSU Alumni Association in 1999 for his outstanding community, state, and national service. While, in, while at MSU, he earned multiple degrees, including a PhD, Master's of Arts, Master's of Science, and Bachelor of Arts. In 2009, Dr. Tenning and his wife, Janet, created an endowment here at A.T. Steele University's Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine that will provide this annual lecture on osteopathy during Founders Day. Dr. and Mrs. Tenning established the Fred C. Tenning PhD President Emeritus Founders Day Osteopathy Lecture Endowment because of their strong belief in perpetuating the importance of osteopathic principles and practices. The purpose of the Tenning Osteopathy Lecture Endowment is to provide a perpetual source of income that will sponsor a lecture by a national recognized expert on neuromusculoskeletal medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine. As I have said, Dr. Tenning was the eighth president of ATSU, serving in the capacity from 1984 to 1996. Personally, I would like to share with you that I started here as a first year medical student in 1987. I was just a hillbilly from the Ozarks of Missouri at that time. <laughs> And the, and the first time I met Dr. Tenning at the annual welcome picnic, he made me feel like someone who was very special to be here. And I will never have never forgotten that, and I would like to thank him for that right now as well. Thank you, Please welcome, join me in welcoming our 2017 Founders Day Tenning Osteopathic Lecture, Dr. Fred Tenning. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> You have to forgive me for sitting down. I've had three major back surgeries, and I had to have a brace on today, and so they put a chair up front here for me. Uh, it's my pleasure and my honor to be able to talk to this great group of young men and women and senior men and women. Uh, before I begin what my speech is going to be about, I want to thank the Department of Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine and the committee that take, made a selection just because we sponsored uh, this occasion, I didn't expect to be giving a talk. But I'm thankful that, that they decided that, that maybe I was worthy once in a while to give one or two talks. So. Uh, and I want also not only thank the committee for this occasion, but I want to also thank the American Association of College of Osteopathic Medicine, the AOA, the uh, uh, House of Delegates, because in, in 1992, our hundredth year, Larry, as you know, our hundredth year, uh, I was given the honor to give the Centennial 100 Year Lecture. And in fact, we've printed a copy of that for you, and you'll get that as you come out. And also, another thing that we did, we printed, was a Paul Kimberly about what is osteopathic medicine. So you'll have two good gifts to, to take with you. As the eighth president of this fine institution, and eight, as you may not know, or you may know, represents new beginnings. And it really was a new beginning for me and a new beginning for KCOM and the future of KCOM. I had been involved in osteopathic medicine for over 49 years. Long time, long time. And I had the responsibility of getting many schools and new schools in and helping the, our, our older schools, our older five schools. It was a, a, a love offering, really, to be able to do this because talking with college presidents who want an osteopathic medical school is very difficult. They don't read, number one. They don't look at what the requirements are. Like, why do I have to have a dean? And why do I have to have two associate deans? And why do I have to have an X reserve amount of money in a fund? Those principles are set out by the American College of Osteopathic Medicine, and they tell us what we have to have. So with that in mind, I, I had to learn three basic principles. I had to learn to uh, be swift to, 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 uh, to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, it's, it's very angry. And one of the principles that I've always practiced in my life is always to use one of the scriptures from uh, the Old Testament, from King David, from Psalms. 
And the one I use because I don't want to be reactive and I don't want to cause problems with people who are interested in starting a new school. I want to help them as much as possible. But the scripture I used is from Psalms 19.14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So what happened was, that was the start of it. And I had never been to Kirksville. I was involved in the uh, Des Moines School in 1898. I wasn't involved. I mean, I had to do review with, with them on new, new programs. Uh, with Philadelphia in 1899, Chicago in 1900. In fact, a young lady that got into Michigan State, her name is Janice Littlejohn, and it was the Littlejohn family that took the cadavers to Chicago to start that school. And then Kansas City in 1916, but I had never been to Kirksville. So in 1983, I received a phone call from a professor at Michigan State University who was on the Board of Trustees of this great institution. And he said, Frederick, you've been nominated to be a candidate for presidency of the founding osteopathic school in Kirksville. And I paused for a few minutes. I said, what? <laughs> he said, yes. Uh, I had a phone call from Kirksville. Uh, and I had another phone call from Dean Megan at Michigan State's College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, wanting to know whether they would recommend me. Well, I realized that, that year-wise, that was 34 years ago, and I first came here. And there was a lady who was the secretary to, of the board, not to the board, of the board. Margaret was a very, very fine real estate lady. So Margaret said to me, can you be here at such and such a time, uh, on such and such a date? I said, well, how do I get to Kirksville? And she said, well, <laughs> you fly Ver Whirly Bird Airlines, and we'll pick you up at, the, up at the airport. Well, Margaret Ralston took me on a grand tour. And 34, 37 years ago, you should have seen this place. Some of our seniors have seen this place. She took me on a tour. The first thing I saw was this beautiful new clinical building. I said, how come you haven't named it after someone? Well, we're, we're still thinking about it, okay? When are they gonna get rid of the, where they load the cattle? And she said, that's being done soon. How about this gasification plant? How about all these coal equipments? How about the old Laughlin Hospital? How about, why is the clinic, the, the first school, sitting outside in the horrible weather, and why is the home of A.T. Still's family still sitting out in the weather? And how come the museum, oh, where's, where's my museum man? Uh, how come, the, there you are, Jason, You've done a fabulous job. Uh, how come the museum only is about two trailer words, two, two trailer wides? So I kept asking questions, and I said, where is the collection of all the osteopathic journals and all the osteopathic documents? took me downstairs to the Timken Burnett building, and they were in boxes in the furnace room. <laughs> then I went up and talked to Georgia Walter in the library. And Georgia said, come and see the equipment I don't have. <laughs> I said, OK, that'd be fine. I'd be glad to do that. And all these things began to boil up in me. And I said, you know, I called my wife, and I said, honey, do I really want to give up a full professorship and an assistant dean's position at a major university? She said, only you and the good Lord know. So always with the type of witnesses I like to have, I use either the Psalms or I use Proverbs. And I was reading Proverbs, and I'll give you one more quote. It said, commit to the Lord every, no, commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Wow, that hit me right between the eyes. My plans will succeed. I gotta do it. I love osteopathic medicine, and you'll see why of some of the great treatments I've had. So I'm gonna begin with a little challenge to all of you. Over 125 years ago this October, Andrew Taylor, still MDDO, flung to the breeze the banner of osteopathy as a reform movement to the medicine of his day, 
Dr. Still conceived osteopathic medicine as a philosophy that could be a guide to the future of American healthcare systems. I hope you've read some of the history. I hope you have it embellished in, in your practice and in your, your life space. But I want to review a little bit of, of the heritage. With, with this heritage you have in mind, I'm here today to challenge you to pick up the banner of osteopathy planted in the doorstep of your osteopathic practice or your student rotations and your clerkships and your in internships and your residencies and witness to the world that the osteopathic profession has a philosophy of medicine to offer for the health and wellness of the American family. Osteopathic medicine can and does make a difference in hands-on care, providing the total family health care needs. Too often, people don't understand manipulative medicine, and it has been misconstrued as only for contribution of the osteopathic profession with little insight into the philosophy and total spectrum of biological mechanisms. That's a hard one to say. But the osteopathic physician is truly a high-tech, high-touch physician in the American healthcare scene who believes that disease is a natural process and that the natural powers are the healers of disease, that the physician must assist, must assist nature. As Louis Pasteur said, in the field of observation, chance favors only those minds which are prepared. Dr. Still possessed one of those minds. Because of his observations and experience in life and in medicine, the old doctor was prepared to charter the first college of osteopathic medicine in 1892. In October of 1892, the first class was enrolled. As the fame of Dr. Sill's teaching, teachings and treatments and the school increased, there was an influx of patients and students to Kirksville, hundreds of which became witnesses to the effectiveness of osteopathic medicine. In fact, the patient-centered hands-on medicine of the American School of Osteopathy with the use of new technologies brought national attention to Kirksville and, osteop and osteopathy. Dr. Still and his colleagues recognized the significance of technology and their advances and in confirming osteopathic diagnosis by having the second x-ray machine west of the Mississippi. And the reason he wanted this machine is people who had joints out of place when he was in, in, in the Civil War, they just cut off the, the arm or the leg or whatever. They didn't, know, they didn't know how to treat it. They didn't know what manipulation was and how to put a joint back together. By the late 1800s, there were over five trainloads of patients coming to Kirksville a day for the hands-on treatment of osteopathic health care. In 1905, even Palmer, you know that name from Palmer Chiropractic, spent five months with A.T. Still and went back to Davenport, Iowa, and did subluxation, period. He didn't take many lessons. The, the uh, 1908 college yearbook, The Osteoblast, stated from one man to 5,015 years, from one small room in a small cottage to a building fully prepared to teach both classroom and laboratory to over 700 students with another ready to house and care for over 100 surgical cases. Do you have the slide? There's the school back in 1905. There's still a piece of that building available. I learned that the other day from our museum expert. But that was a beautiful facility for the year of 1905. Today, ladies and gentlemen, as a profession, we can say that from one man has come over 74,000 practicing osteopathic physicians, providing over hundreds, in fact millions, of patient visits per year, all from one college to currently at least 20% of all students who attend medical schools are enrolled in osteopathic institutions. According to the American Association of Colleges of Osteopathic Medicine accredited 33 colleges with 15 branch campuses or we now have 48 colleges of osteopathic medicine in 31 locations throughout the country. Six schools are state supported and 27 are private with more than 27,000 students enrolled. Many of our colleges, for example, A.T. Still, Kirksville, A.T. Still, Soma, are integral components of a comprehensive health science university. When I was meeting with the board back in eight, nine, 18, here I go again, 19, <laughs> I'm not that old, uh, and, 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 and nine, nine, believe it or not, in, nine, in, 1980, in 1984, I began talking to the executive committee of the board 
saying we need more slots for clerkship training. We have to have more spots. I was able to arrange a, a, with a man named Barry Doublestein, Dr. Barry Doublestein, who was in charge of the foundation in, in uh, Georgia, to come up with a concept called the Osteopathic Institute of the South. He signed up 36 hospitals. And because of his favoritism here, we got a lot of those clerkships. But I was looking at Arizona, and Arizona was wide open for additional students in, in their hospitals. Dean Ross and I visited with the dean of, uh, of the University of Arizona. And he said, sure, we'll be glad to open these for you if you can prove that these young men and women know what they're doing. Well, in addition, then, I met with the executive committee of the Board of Trustees, and I said, you know, we, we need something else. We need to become a multifaceted university. We need to have a PT school, an OT school, physician assistant school, and we need to have a physical training school for trainers to, to work with athletes. And I would love to see a dental school. Well, Dr. B.B. Slaughter, who just passed away a month and a half ago, said, you've got to be crazy. We can't afford all that money. And I said, B.B., if we don't, we're going to be bankrupt because we need additional spot, spots for students. We need additional funds coming in from tuition. And if we could build a little facility on the campus of Grand Canyon University, we would be able to enroll all of these students and we'd make some money. I'm not money hungry, but it's important <laughs> to, to buy things with dollars and cents, as you well know. So that's what happened. They allowed us to open all those slots. And the board at that time, uh, I requested their consideration in changing the name now that we were a major university. Why don't we call it the, uh, the Andrew Taylor Still University of Health Sciences? And he said, we'll have to put that off for a little while. So we had to do that. But also, from that one hospital that you see, had come by, oh, 1983, when I did a study for the, for the university, 230 osteopathic hospitals. Did you imagine we had that many hospitals at that time? <coughs> then we started merging. The MDs started buying our small hospitals. We started infiltrating into their hospitals. And at one point in time, a friend of mine, another young man who was named Dr. Anthony Tersini, was an assistant administrator in one of the DO hospitals in Michigan. Today, he is the president of the largest Catholic hospital corporation in America. He's not only the president, but he's a CEO. He believes in osteopathy, and he said, Frederick, I'm going to open up all 196 of my hospitals because I believe in what osteopathic medicine does. So you young men and women are looking at hospitals. Look for some of the hospitals like Sisters of Ascension. There's an Ascension Hospital in Flint, which is a joint hospital, has tremendous training programs. And I'm not trying to sell one hospital or the other. But that's what has happened in this short period of time, in those 37 years, 34 years, what has taken place. Now to my first objective. She has the objectives on the screen. The hands make a difference. My 66-year 66, 66 involvement in osteopathy began when I was about 15 years old. In fact, about a week before my 15th birthday. I was playing football. It was supposed to be touch football. <laughs> it turned out to be tackle football. My primary doctor at that time was an MD. He gave me a, some kind of a sleeping pill or a, a muscle relaxant. It did nothing. I was working at a drugstore, and the owner, Mr. Valera, said, I want to talk to your mother. There's a new osteopathic physician. I didn't know what he was talking about. He said, this man is trained as a primary care doctor. He's a graduate of the Kirksville College of Osteopathic Medicine in 1991. He's a great man. His name is John Williams. Call your mom. I want you to go up and see Dr. Williams. Now, if you understand what it means to use your hands and to talk to people and find out what's going on with an individual in life, what their family's all about, what they do in school. He started right off telling me all about 
these situations and how it was important for him to understand me before he treated me. He helped me get on the table. He took off my T-shirt. He began palpating my back. He found a lesion. And, and he said, it hurts there, doesn't it, son? I said, yes, sir, it certainly does. He said, did you hurt your head at all? And I said, no, it just really hurt my left shoulder. So he put me on the table, talking to me all the time, bent over me, put his arms around me, and went, mm. He said, we call that the Kirksville Crunch. <laughs> and I said, well, hallelujah, that's great. The pain's gone. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful. Well, <clears throat> that was my first introduction to osteopathic medicine. And I don't believe things happen by chance, you know. I think there are reasons for things happening. I truly believe that. that just don't, nothing happens, nothing happens by chance. So then I finished my bachelor's degree at Michigan State. There were no jobs in 1959, and I went on for a master's degree in rehabilitation counseling, working with a handicap. For about four years, I was a counselor and became a senior counselor, and fortunately, I was promoted to district supervisor of the whole eastern part of the city of Detroit and, and Wayne County, if you know anything about Michigan. And in that area, I had 14 counselors working under my supervision, was the Detroit Osteopathic Hospital. And Detroit Osteopathic Hospital at that time, by Phil Arcati was the name of the, the president, uh, called me and said, could you come and give lectures to the clinical clerks about rehabilitation services and what their patients can handle and what they could have and what is available. I said yes, and I did that for a period of time. Then all of a sudden, I saw that something was going on at Michigan State University in 1970. The situation came about that they were developing an educational psychology program, but with a fellowship and the Office of Medical Education Research and Development, because we had two medical schools at Michigan State at that time. And I thought, my goodness, what are they going to do? And I went and investigated. Uh, they were going to work on helping medical schools, physicians, PhDs, an evaluation process of their discipline to help train doctors be better hands-on doctors, basically. So I finished that PhD, and at the same time, a paper, the local paper came and said, quote unquote, Michigan State University is transferring the College of Osteopathic Medicine in Pontiac, Michigan to become a state-supported school, the first state-supported school in the profession. And you know, Larry, how hard it was to raise the money to get that going, that whole process going. It was fabulous. I was in a classroom, door knock, with Dean Megan, the dean of the new osteopathic school. He said uh, to the professor, can I talk to Fred Tinning? Certainly. I went out in the hallway, and Dr. Megan said, do you remember me? And I said, yes, sir. You were director of medical education at uh, Botsford Ziegler, and uh, you were also a pediatrician. He said, good memory, good memory. He said, I talked to the Dean of the College of Education, Dr. Goldhammer, asking him if he knew someone that could become an administrative assistant for a period of time with me. He recommended me. And so Dean Megan said, you've been recommended, uh, so I want you to come and work for me as an administrative assistant. I said, but I'm already a graduate assistant. I don't think I can do two jobs. He said, Goldhammer said he'll let you go. You can do it because I'm going to pay you pretty good. That made me smile. So he said to me, let me show you the offices. He took me to the third floor of Fee Hall that we had renovated for our medical schools and <clears throat> showed me an office with, with major facility, a secretary, and two other offices for doing all kinds of paperwork. And I said, this is a nice office. He said, it's yours. I think my chin's still bouncing off the floor. And he said, beside that, Frederick, uh, I heard that you're doing a, uh, your PhD in the utilization of simulated patients in training first year osteopathic medical students in neurology. I said, well, news goes around pretty fast. I just formed my committee, you know, for, for, the, for working on the PhD. And he said, uh, 
do you need a lab or anything to work on? I said, yes, I'd really like to build the first simulation lab. You see the lab we have here. So we built a new lab for, for, and, and used athletes, by the way, as our patients because they didn't mind being manhandled by, by new students. And then at the same time, Mike said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay for your dis dissertation. I'm going to give you $8,000 a year. Well, I mean, that was unheard of. I mean, that, that's a lot of money. That's like $32,000 a year. Went to work then for Dean Megan. Opened the state-supported college in Texas of osteopathic medicine. The state-supported college of osteopathic medicine in New Jersey. Worked on the Ohio School, the Oklahoma School, uh, several other schools, about six schools. And parenthetically, later on, I came out of disability retirement in 07 and built the 25th College of Osteopathic Medicine in Yakima, Washington. Ah, they know Yakima, Washington. So, uh, so this 13-year experience at, at Michigan State University helped me greatly when I got that phone call be considered to be the eighth president of A.T. Still University. So let me skip over a little bit here. The next situation, you heard about why the hands make a difference for me and how it's done my career, was <coughs> after the board interviewed me and selected me as the president, got a phone call from, God bless him, Max Gutenson. Max said, can you come tomorrow morning? <laughs> I said, Max, I'm going to just be moving down here very shortly. And he said, uh, maybe we can meet when you have your first board meeting. Because I was really concerned about this beautiful facility not named after anybody. So I went to the board, my agenda. One of them was the gold medallion for people with 50 years or more service. The opportunity to name that facility the Gutenstone Health and Wellness Clinic. Because after all, we are about health and wellness. The board unanimously reported that out without any question whatsoever. Max then was discussing my resume. He said, Fred, I see that you were involved in uh, some kind of like maybe mission work. And I said, no, I helped start the uh, Medical and Dental Society where we send a lot of people on trips across the country. In addition, I was faculty advisor for the Varsity Club, faculty advisor for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and I was team chaplain of all things. And Mike Megan said, I want you to do these things because they're important to let the presence of these people know what osteopathic medicine is really all about, how it helps people. Because he was having a battle with the MD school, believe it or not. So anyway, that took place. And Max and I began talking. And I said, Max, tell me about a story I heard about a young man who came to Kirksville. And after two years, because he didn't have the money, he transferred to Kansas City. He said, well, yeah, you know, the stories about this young man that came here in the late 30s and early 40s because he was a missionary and he wanted to go back and treat people in Uganda. I didn't even know where Uganda was at that time. So uh, <clears throat> Max and I talked about this young man and how we could help him. Well, he had 10 or 12 churches that were sponsoring him, wanting to sponsor him. So he said... I think you should try and talk with him if you can. And I said, well, he's already in Uganda. I don't think I can talk to him anymore. And uh, he said, well, maybe we can talk to some, somebody that knows a little bit about him. But we could never find anybody else that had an intimate relationship with him. So he went to Uganda. He opened up a small clinic working with three different tribes of people from Uganda, doing a phenomenal job, practicing his osteopathic medicine. One day... They decided in, in the country they were going to build a hospital, a hospital of about 30 beds. There were two British physicians, plus members of the government, and one day they were standing on a portico of their, their hospital, having coffee or whatever, and along comes a stretcher carrying a man, two people carrying him. They went right on by, waved to the people at the hospital. The day and a half, well, a day, full day later in the afternoon, they come back the other way. And the stretcher is full of supplies, what appeared to be supplies. And the man who was on the stretcher is walking. So they 
waved to these people and said, can we talk to you for a few minutes? The conversation was really an interesting one. He asked one gentleman, you were on the stretcher the other day. What, 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 what went on? Where, where did you go? Where did you come from? He said, sir, gentlemen, you see, five miles past your hospital, which is not opened yet, there's a clinic run by a, a fine man who comes to our village, who checks on the mothers who have had babies, the senior citizens who are hurting. He brings them some of the supplies that he has that they can use. If one of our young people has hurt himself playing a sport, his magic hands, he called them, puts it back in place. So he was doing the touching manipulation of, of this, the, this three tribes that he was working with. And they went on and they said, let me ask you another question. What else does he do? He said, let's make it simple. He treats us for everything. But you see, ladies and gentlemen, the hands are different. Hooray for hands. Right? Okay. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the third point on the hands make a difference. My daughter, Dr. Laura Tinning, who is board certified in OMNT and, or OMNM or whatever one we want to call it today, <laughs> and, and family medicine. She's a professor down at uh, the new osteopathic school at Dothan, Alabama. And when I saw her give a presentation at the Flint Osteopathic Hospital on a, a baby that had torticollis, I wanted her to give this presentation on the hands make a difference. Dr. Laura. Don't worry, it's short. <laughs> he won't give me that much time. What I do want to say before I start this is an example of how much far ahead you guys are going to be than your MD colleagues. I was working in a clinic at Michigan State, and I was a third-year medical student, a fourth-year family medicine MD resident was also rotating. And one of the doctors said to that resident, go check the ribs on the patient in room eight. She goes, do what? And he said, check the ribs on the patient in room eight. And she said, I don't know what you mean. I want you to check the rib motion on the patient in room eight. She said, you mean touch the patient? And he went, Laura, go show her what to do. I don't have time for this. So I went and taught the senior family medicine resident how to check rib motion on his patient because she had no idea what that meant. So you guys are way far ahead of the game in terms of being able to not only help with your hands, but diagnose with them too. And uh, he said, he mentioned the magic hand. So that's what, in Michigan, they called me before I moved from Michigan to Alabama. I primarily do OMM on pregnant women and babies. That's my specialty, my kind of niche specialty. And I got a lot of consults from my MD colleagues in town. And their patients would show up, and I would ask them, do you know why you're here to see me? My doctor just said, you have magic hands, and you'll take away my pain. <laughs> and I said... And most of the MD OBs were patients of mine, too. So they knew what I did. And I said, well, if I have your permission to touch you, then that's what I'll do. So, so this is just a short um, presentation about a baby with torticollis. This was his picture. His name is Lucas. I have permission to use his name because his mother is one of my best friends. So this is what Lucas looked like right after delivery. And he had... 12 vacuum attempt assisted delivery with 11 pop-offs. Now, most hospitals have a rule of not more than, who knows what the rule is? It's like around two to four. Three, okay, thank you. I knew it was, I knew it was low, I knew it wasn't 12. And you can, I mean, you haven't delivered babies yet, but the sutures aren't supposed to look like that. Now, the amount of override in an infant's skull is limited by the membranes, so, it couldn't get much worse than that. But that was him on day one of his life. And this is not actually his mother, but this just shows, can I actually see that picture? Yeah. This actually shows right away how you can, oh, what I do? There we go. 
right here, he's, his neck is tilted to the left, so he's got a torticollis already. And this is just days after delivery. And I treated him in the hospital, and then he followed up with me in the clinic. And you can see, I mean, we had to, he's, he's jammed in the wedge of a couch so that he can't tilt to the left, so he looks like he's tilted right because we're forcing him to do that to try to prevent him from always holding his head to the left. It's kind of fun when you can have pictures of your best friend's kid with what age they are to use for your presentation. <laughs> and so just a little about torticollis. It's usually called by an imbalance in the strength of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And most people think that if he's got a left torticollis, he'd be like this, they think that this muscle is too strong or it's hypertonic, spasmed, whatever. Well, in Lucas's case, he didn't get fixed because that's what everybody assumed, the physical therapist that was seeing him. Well, I kept seeing him and I told his mom this one day, I'm like, I got it. At three months, his head was like this, bobbing side to side. He could look up with his eyes a little bit, but he couldn't hold his head up. So... Of all the people in the short white coats here, what nerve innervates the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius? Thank you. <laughs> Where does it exit the skull? Whoever said jugular foramen is correct. So, so when I finally realized that it was actually not his left sternocleidomastoid that was tight, but his right that was inhibited, all the physical therapy in the world, stretching that muscle, would not have fixed him. So you can see here, at six months, he's still a little side bent left. And then, when I, figured out, when I figured it out, well, I actually treated him around three months when he was still bobbing. And I told his mom I got it today, like, to be able to get his spinal accessory nerve on the side where it was problematic, which was his right side because it was inhibited on the right side. So I treated the petrous portion of his temporal bone where it, I've got pictures. Well, you can see at nine months, he's pretty straight now. I'm going to go here. So we've got temporal bone, jugular foramen where the big black arrow is. It's kind of like the x-ray sign when they put an X on the x-ray. Um, and what I felt on him was this jugular foramen on the right side was actually jammed. It was jammed toward the sphenobasilar symphysis. And when I released the restriction here, his spinal accessory nerve could fire properly on that side. His mom called me two hours later and said he's holding his head up. Two hours after the treatment when I said I got it this time. Like I figured out in my head what was actually going on. And just a bigger picture of it. So his mom, that's him at five. He turns 12 on Sunday, and his mom is convinced that he would have been mentally challenged had he not seen me. Because if those bones can't move to accommodate the brain, what happens to the brain? Doesn't work as well. Doesn't, well he certainly wouldn't have been playing football if his head were still down here. I, told, I sent her a picture of him at birth saying, I'm talking about Lucas today. She said, yay, this is him today. He turns 12 on, and he sent me one in his football uniform. And uh, so, yep, the magic hands, they make a big deal. Use them. Use them. Let's give my daughter a good hand. <laughs> Proud fathers can say that. So yeah. our objective number two is called the witnesses surrounding us. From one man's observations and through his prepared mind, curiosity, and perseverance, a unique form of American medicine was created called osteopathy, the fastest growing health profession in America today, committed to providing quality, high-tech, high-touch osteopathic health care. This phenomenon is the result of hundreds and, in fact, thousands of people who have witnessed the effectiveness of osteopathic principles and echo Dr. Sill's dissatisfaction with traditional medicine. In fact, part of that came through his experience in the Civil War and then working with the Walker Saw Mission when he saw how people were treated by old MDs. Dr. Still, in, in, 19, in 1897 ceremony at, in Kirksville, created 
celebrated the, the licensing of the practice of osteopathy and stated, right at this point, I will say osteopathy knows of and has a high respect for general surgery. In its fullest meaning, osteopathy is a complete system of science, fills the bill in general diseases, obstetrics, and surgery. And at any time and place, when a person tells you the osteopathic physician is not a complete system, or osteopathy is not a complete system, of itself, in and of itself, and cannot do all that comes before it just as well and, and better without the aid of any other system, he tells you what is not true. You see, in, that, in those days, they didn't understand about manipulation or holistic medicine or health care. At the same ceremony, an osteopathic witness of his day, William Smith, MD, a teacher of anatomy and physiology from the Royal Academy of Physicians and surgeons in Edinburgh, Scotland, said this is a doctor. This said this of Dr. Still in the American School of Osteopathy, and I quote: "I want to speak of a future of osteopathy. It is through the work that has been accomplished in this building, and through the osteopaths who have gone out through this institution, that osteopathy is recognized as a science and a legal method of healing. Since the days of Dr. Still and Dr. Smith, 125 years ago." We have had witnesses surrounding us who have told the world what osteopathic medicine has to offer and who have helped us preserve traditions and plan tomorrows. Whether, whether patients or physicians, the stories and accounts of success and praise are many. The Journal of Osteopathy and other osteopathic publications are filled with expressions of commitment of satisfaction with the use of osteopathic techniques and procedures. However, history also tells us of an organized opposition to these witnesses in the form of the AMA, who became concerned with the increasing strength of the osteopathic profession during World War I. It was proven even in hearings before legislative committees that the course of study were equivalent. During this period of time, the stress in, uh, on osteopathic physicians, the profession, and our leaders from history was stronger than ever. However, our forefathers continued witnessing that Dr. Still founded osteopathy to improve upon the present practice of medicine, surgery, and obstetrics for the patients and their families. In 1927, Leon E. Page Dio witnessed, and I quote, the fear is something expressed that osteopathy will be absorbed by medicine. This cannot be so, since osteopathy is a part of medicine and consists of a set of principles which are true. As long as the profession of osteopathy maintains its own educational institutions and abides by its principles, it will maintain its identity. When the principles of osteopathy are identical with the principles of medical practice, the profession of osteopathy will have fulfilled its mission. If you had read anything about 1938, when the policy of the AMA regarding DOs became official, MDs were forbidden to engage in any professional relationship with DOs. The AMA's intent was to eliminate their competition. Instead, it made the osteopathic profession band together and create a stronger association, one of unity. Remember also, when the AMA influence was so strong that it convinced the uh, General Hershey, I believe was his name, General Hershey of the, of the uh, Corps, Medical Corps, that DOs should stay home and only MDs should go into, into service. What he didn't realize is this proved to be a blessing in disguise for our osteopathic profession. You know, chance doesn't take place there. It's been planned. As the MDs left home to join the service with the DOs closed the gap in health care throughout the United States by, don't, don't forget we didn't have all those hospitals and yet taking place by proving the ability, their ability to provide excellent osteopathic medical services to the families of the civilian population, the osteopathic physicians gain respect, acceptance, and new friends and witnesses. In Michigan, for example, the DO built hospitals in, in communities large and small throughout the state. They became about one-fifth of the physician population and provided one-third of the primary care, resulting in the sixth and first state-supported College of Osteopathic Medicine in 1970. In fact, during this time period, from 1874 into World War II, national known advocates such as Dr. Laura. You got to flash him up there. You see the advocates. Read which ones you want to read. 
I'm just going to read a few of the important ones aloud for him because it's easier for me to see the typing than for him. So this is George Bernard Shaw. Meanwhile, the vogue of osteopathy grows, and no wonder. Go to an ordinary doctor and, well, I don't say that one can cure you and the other cannot. I'll say that. But I do say that the moment the osteopath's fingers are on you, you know that you are in technically skilled hands. After a visit to Kirksville in 1919, former President William Howard Taft was so impressed with osteopathy that he secured a list of osteopaths in cities he would be visiting. On that note, growing up, I didn't know MDs existed. I knew at age of four I was going to be a doctor, but I didn't know MDs existed. So, we're going to Mark Twain now. And Mark Twain said, the educated physician will himself be an osteopath. My favorite A.T. Still quote that I'll add to the end of this is, it is the object of the physician to find health. Anyone can find disease. That's our job. We look for health in our patients, not disease. However, it wasn't until the AOA Board of Trustees Committee on Awards established the annual AT Memorial Lecture that the contributions of osteopathic physicians and other osteopathic leaders to the American healthcare were documented. The first one was J. Stead Denslow, D.O., in 1947. He presented the first AT Still Memorial Lecture, The Place of the Osteopathic Concept in the Healing Arts. At one of the profession's key researchers, as one of the profession's key researchers and witnesses, Denzel continued leading the way through osteopathic practice and clinical research. You see a little park outside called the Denzel Park that's named after him. By the way, he was married to uh, Dr. Still's granddaughter. From the first presentation in 1947 until the presentation today, which marks the 125th year of osteopathy, osteopathy Seventy years of A.T. Still Founders Day lectures have had a common thread. The fundamental philosophy, principles, and practice of osteopathic medicine in making a difference in the American healthcare system. A few individuals that I want to highlight, start with number one, R. McFarland Tilly, D.O., in 1952 stated, Our unique contribution lie, contributions lie in developing the manifest truths of the osteopathic concept and integrating them into a whole fabric of the practice of the healing arts. In 1959, Autobahn Dressler D.O., in his address entitled, Still's Greatest Contribution to Medicine, stated, Our school of medicine has changed the behavior. It created not only a change in thinking in medicine, but has reversed completely the very foundation of medicine. When A.T. Still redirected man's attention to the body as well as the disease, and stated that the things necessary to cure disease are, reside in, in, within the body, he made the greatest and the most profound statement in medicine in over 2,000 years. Old Wally Pearson, Dr. Pearson, some of you men may know him, quite a man, quite a guy. He said and stated very bluntly in an unpublished presentation, we need to develop the element of excellence over and above equality. The touch of the hands make a difference. In 1970, Carl K. Lyons D.O. in his lecture echoed the health and wellness base of osteopathic medicine when he said, we challenge any system of medical practice not based on the full understanding of man as a whole in both health and disease. We stand ready to offer an approach to excellence and a new concept of excellence which can bring the entire healthcare system to the peak of performance. Myron Megan in 1975 stated, we must therefore, I think, focus our energies on what we as a profession have done well, the preparation of individuals who will practice at the primary care level. And herein lies a unique opportunity for the osteopathic profession as an effective organized opposition to make a lasting contribution to the public health. Paul Kimberly, had several statements, but I have prepared for you a, a booklet prepared by, in 1986 by Paul Kimberly called The Contributions of Andrew Taylor Still to Medicine. And we're going to present that to you as a gift as you leave. One of the great women of our profession in 1980, Louise W. Estelle D.O., one of the profession's outstanding women, in fact, in her presentation, Reflections and Forecasts, stated, <clears throat> 
But in the long term, the osteopathic concept will survive because true principles never die. They may be adverted, they may be submerged, even denied, but they will emerge again stronger than ever. They have only to be applied every day in patient care to show how fundamental and timeless they really are. In 1988, Frank McDivitt, DO and past president of the AOA, in his presentation entitled Paradox or Oxymoron, explained the paradox is that at the height of our achievement, we have a new crisis in self-confidence. We must decide who we are and who we want to be. Our identity will be lost because we cease to practice osteopathic medicine. Asking you today, how about today? What are you doing? What practice of osteopathic medicine are you using? Are you touching? Are you treating your patients? Within this overview lies 125 years of heritage, a cross-section of quality witnesses and demonstrated commitment to the philosophy and principle of osteopathic medicine. Therefore, since we have so great a representation of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race which is set before us. To run the race, we must have faith in the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Remember, it was the faith in their practice of osteopathy that the men and women of old gained approval and made a difference in the American healthcare system. They demonstrated their belief in the technological sound medicine that was patient-centered. As a few of the presenters from the last 50 years, I'll just mention a few names. You may know them. Edward Stiles, Harold Magoon, Jr., Harold Blood, by the way. Dr. Blood stopped in my office the first week I was doing so much reading I had a bad headache. He put me on my conference table and treated me. <laughs> and his son, Stephen uh, Blood, Wayne English, Dr. Philip Greenman, uh, the man who's written many texts on manual medicine, Michael Kuchera, Martin Richardson, William Johnson, Karen Steele, Laura Tenning, Lisa DiStefano, Lee Rice, Mar Mike Lockwood, and Edna Lay. All these men and women have strived to preserve the heritage of our osteopathic medicine. Point number three, the final one, the objective, preserving traditions, planning tomorrows. <clears throat> a Time magazine cover stated, story in 1991 on alternative medicine stated, and I quote, the problem with modern medicine is that it is only pathologically oriented and, protect, and practitioners don't take the time to communicate with their patients. We know that. In a report of the Pew Health, Health Professions Commission, October 1991, Thomas W. Langford, MD, wrote the following in the forward, an executive summary entitled Health America Practitioners for the Year 2005 and Beyond. Talking about our major form of health care, he stated, to my mind, the inadequacy of the microsystem, e.g., the medical complex that a patient enters with countless physicians, nurses, technicians, all kinds of test equipment is the root problem in the American health care today, and no amount of, of restructuring or refinancing at the macro level will correct, will correct the situation. In fact, significantly restricting the resources available to this kind of enterprise could have dire consequences because there is little reason to believe that resources, resource containment alone will cause the countless microsystems to behave in a more rational and effective way. They probably do not know how. Consequently, the quality of patient care will, will falter and suffer. In his concluding remarks, Dr. Laughlin said, the Pew Health Professions Commission believes that change must begin with a new vision of what health professionals ought to be doing that they are not doing today. In general terms, they need to be closer to the patients and their families, surprise. And they need to understand better why people have the way, why people behave the way they do, under, particularly under stress. The traditional model of medical education and practice based largely on organ-specific physical illness is no longer adequate. I believe, and I think our profession many times believes, that this is the reason that the MDs today are going after our young men and women who have finished clerkships in primary care because they know hands-on medicine. They know how to treat that rib when somebody tells them to treat a rib. And I, I believe in fully that our, our, our practices that we're training in our hospitals of allowing kids to do these rotating clerkships is really critical, critical to your future, whether you become a, a, 
an internal medicine specialist or even a surgeon. I've seen a surgeon do an osteopathic treatment. Very important. Con conversion to the new model recommended by the commission is the greatest single challenge faced by the health profession. They really don't know what they're doing. And we have already that type of practice. We know what we're doing. These comments sound like A.T. Still in his reform movement of, of the 1800s and many witnesses following him. I genuinely believe, based on what has been said in this executive summary of the Pew Commission, that our osteopathic profession has, does, and will have an answer for the needs of the American public, and that the answer is a philosophy and, a, and principles of the osteopathic physician's art and science of primary care practice. Listening to the patients, touching the patients, and treating the patient, the osteopathic physician does and can make a difference through his or her high-tech, high-touch approach to patient care. Look at today and what has developed in the DO and MD, AOA, AMA graduate education cooperation. They're trying to recruit more young DOs because you've had that kind of clinical practice, hands-on practice, working in various rotations, you know them all. And so when they apply for a residency program, they're choosing the DO student because they know exactly what they're doing. In the, I'm not saying MDs don't know, but you know, I've, I've seen situations take place where a lady was in labor on, on an elevator and the two young men said, my, my discipline is proctology. I've never delivered a baby. I couldn't believe that, but that was true. In the summer of 1990, President's page of the Kirksville Magazine, I wrote the following to our alumni and friends to highlight the significant difference the osmetic model of healthcare can make. In his chapter, Force Technology, High Tech, High Touch, from the book Megatrends, Nesbitt said, whenever new technology, high tech, is introduced into society, there must be a counterbalancing human response, high touch, or the technology may be rejected. Nesbitt noted that our Response to the high tech all around us was the evolution of a highly personal value system to compensate for the impersonal nature of technology. In other words, we must learn to balance the material wonders of technology with the spiritual demands of the human nature. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? One more page. <laughs> so the microsystem micro system the Pew Commission is speaking of is really not working, not as well as it need be. Therefore, from my point of view, nowhere is the phenomenon of high-tech, high-touch more important than in today's osteopathic healthcare education system. Today's osteopathic healthcare system demands emphasis on the interpersonal relationship between the doctor and a patient and the family while using the latest in medical technology. It demands the osteopathic physician work with the patients, not only through the interviewing process, but also through the touching process of knowing, loving, serving, and treating the patients with the science and art of osteopathic modalities. We must keep our primary care clinical clerkship rotations in any hospital that we attend. The osteopathic physician is a hands-on holistic physician who by his or her education and training is required to understand the dynamics and principles of structure and function, body unity, and the health power of nature. A.T. still encourages students to use their heads and their hands to diagnose ailments. He said, and I quote, I want the osteopath to be a hunter and find the game, otherwise his work will be unsatisfactory. He said in his book, Osteopathic Research and Practice, finding game, finding game for the osteopathic physician involves evaluating the interplay of a patient's body, mind, and spirit. This means that the physician must often look beyond a patient's symptoms to the address the totality of an illness. Physicians should not just medicate and ambulate. The challenge for today's osteopathic physician and our osteopathic institutions is to keep our basic tenets from the past, the high touch techniques and the focusing on people oriented primary care and health promotion and incorporate these ideas into the sophisticated practice of osteopathic medicine into the next century and for years beyond. In the fall of 1991 at the AOA GME conference, Dr. Eli Ginsberg, a famous medical economist, asked what, are, what, what there was about osteopathic education, both undergraduate and graduate, that will have distinguishing and distinctive characteristics in the year 2000 and beyond. In other words, I think he was asking, does the osteopathic physician make a difference? Ginsberg went on to say that ambulatory care should be an area 
where the osteopathic profession has an advantage over the allopathic physician. Since primary care is such an area, the osteopathic profession has an advantage. In fact, he went on to say that the monolith of the AMA is going to take many years and redirect itself to primary care, and we have it now. Everyone involved in educating, training, and patient care must encourage our students to stay primary osteopathic medicine and, in, and use their sorry, and use their osteopathic philosophy and principles of this high-tech, high-touch profession. Our students must experience firsthand through preceptor training what an osteopathic physician believe and practice and what the patient feels about the doctor. Without our knowledge gained from hands-on education and talking with our patients, an osteopathic physician, whether a general practitioner or specialist, our students will vote with their feet. Our teaching facilities large and small, must continue to provide high-tech, high-touch, clinical clerkship, primary education, and training needed to compete as a, as a quality system for healthcare. This must be true of joint staff MDDO facilities, whether they're, wherever they're located. There must be an emphasis on quality primary care, osteopathic medicine and philosophy, and in principles presented in our colleges, our hospital education programs, and in the osteopathic physician's office. <clears throat> our tradition is that of being a high-tech, high-touch caring profession. It is up to each of our osteopathic physicians, students, and osteopathic institutions to keep this much-needed philosophy and its principles alive. All of us here, I believe, take great pride in being part of an osteopathic profession and a con concern and commitment to unity. Yes, the healthcare profession has problems but I believe that there has not been a more opportune time in history for the osteopathic profession to capitalize on its strengths. These strengths include, one, osteopathic diagnosis and treatment, most definitely including neuromusculoskeletal manipulative medicine, the laying out of hands, understanding what structure and function means. Number two, tra traditional emphasis on primary care for the whole family, family medicine, pediatrics, sports medicine, geriatrics, OB-GYN, internal medicine, general surgery maintain our clinical clerkship rotations and even in these disciplines. Holistic approach to patient care, concern for the total person, the interplay of body, mind, and spirit. Four, traditional emphasis on rotating clerkships for students and for DO internships, whether in our own or joint staff medical centers that emphasize primary care. Six, five, our colleges continue commitment to recruiting men and women who want to make a difference through osteopathic primary care. Continue commitment to the community involved in service for the public good. Seven, continued emphasis on service to the rural America and inner city. Because think of that population, they don't have a great deal of primary care. Traditional emphasis on preventive medicine, the holistic osteopathic medical approach. And nine, our pursuit of excellence and quality in educating and training high-tech, high-touch osteopathic physicians to serve families. In conclusion, it must be our desire to preserve the traditions of osteopathic philosophy and principles as set forth by A. Andrew Taylor Still by planning tomorrows that include the osteopathic philosophy in our education, training, and practice. <clears throat> we must not allow the high-tech modalities of today to replace the tenets of the osteopathic philosophy of medicine that stands alone and, of, and viability after 125 years of successful application to the maintenance of health and the prevention of treatment of disease. We must emphasize that in every responsibility involved in osteopathic medicine, physicians, administrators, health professionals, hospital administrators, educators, and students, to be part of a great representation of witnesses surrounding us today. Each person must take a leadership role in making a difference. We must remember that every caring work of the past all that men and women serving in osteopathic medicine have suffered and dedicated their lives to is forever incomplete unless we of the present day lay hold of it and carry it on. So lay hold of the witnesses, my friends, and carry it on in your practice because your osteopathic heritage of high-tech, high-touch healthcare does and will make a difference to your patients, their families, and the American healthcare system. Each of you will receive a copy of our uh, lecture by, well, my lecture of, of the centennial as, as a souvenir, and also one of Paul Kimberly, 
on what osteopathic medicine is all about. So with that, I say thank you, God bless you, and may you, your profession go on for another, 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 oh, you want to say something? Say, my daughter needs to say something. I just want to speak to the quality of education that you guys are getting here. I graduated in 2000, and yes, I look 29, but I graduated in 2000. <laughs> and when I went out for my third and fourth year, I was in an osteopathic hospital in Detroit. My first rotation of my third year was general surgery. And our surgeon said, well, the patient in this room has post-op ileus. And I said, well, I can fix that. He said, how? I said, with my hands. And the patient was discharged hours later. For the rest of my third year, fourth year, and I stayed there for my internship, I was paged overhead, Dr. Tenning to room 256. I treated every post-op patient because their outcomes were better. Their stay was a day or two instead of seven. They didn't get post-op complications. And so I had an OMM con consulting service when I was a medical student. So you guys can do it too. Thank you. Because I learned that from Dr. Strait and the, all the other people you're learning from here. So you guys know how to do it. You just got to get out there and do it. I will not be here for the 150th. <laughs> <laughs> She'd be here. Thank you very much for your attention. and appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tenning. Thank you very much. In honor of you giving this lecture this year, we want to show our appreciation for this by giving you this plaque for you as well. My goodness. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the Billy. Sure was, I'm sure. glad we hired you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Me too, by the way. And I got to say with, to this fine president, and we are blessed to have him as president, and I'm glad I signed his diploma in 1984. <laughs> <laughs> Love you. Very good. Thank you. I think we need a picture of this. Okay. Let's Sorry. Let's do this. Excuse yeah, me. We have one more thing. Just a second. Uh, go ahead and get that. Thank you. We also have uh, Dr. Bailey's here from Mayop. So I just want to—he's the president this year. So thank you for all the work that you're doing to, for the profession and for the association. Uh, some, some, some wonderful things. And so, uh, boy, it's going to be a great uh, next couple of days. So tomorrow night we're going to have the birthday celebration, right, for Founders Day. So uh, we're looking forward to seeing all the students, faculty, staff, and alums uh, tomorrow evening. And there's one thing coming down from the president's office. If you just hold on tight just for one minute, our office is so organized and does so well. They've got the last thing. And uh, if you'll, yeah, go ahead and sit down, Dr. Tinning. Fantastic. So we have a little something for Dr. Tinning. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And uh, I'm going to have Billy hold this. But uh, as you walked in, you might have noticed that uh, there is a building named on campus. Uh, for Dr. Tinning, and uh, we were able to find a local, I don't know if Colleen's here, uh, the artist who did this, I don't know if she was able to make it. Uh, we did invite her if she was uh, able to come, but uh, I'll let you kind of unveil it, Dr. Tinning, if you just want to kind of pull away the blue. There we go. But yeah, it's uh, the Tinning Education Building, so we'd like to give that to you in, in honor of, there we go. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Thanks, Dr. Tate. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have a great Founders Day. This is great. Thank you.